Simone clutches the two-foot-long environment canister in her lap tightly. It's reinforced enough to take several direct shots from a maxed-out pulse rifle, but she refuses to tempt fate by allowing any possibility of it falling to the shuttle's floor. The cutting next to her observes, trying to decrypt the expression the Terran currently holds. Simone's eyes are in focus, yet somehow utterly empty at the same time. The rest of her face is strangely neutral and unmoving. Her children are in the safest hands, Chuck whispers, hoping to see a positive reaction. The only people that offer to help her kids are kind of being hunted by some of the most dangerous groups in the galaxy. I wouldn't call that safe, Simone responds bitterly. Chuck wraps her arms around herself, looking away. Sorry, she apologises, knowing the danger is because of her. Snapping her eyes to the Cali, Simone partially forces herself out of the emotional rut. Fuck, no, that's not on you, it's just... I'm always... I can't... The Terran struggles to formulate her thoughts, unsure of what exactly to say. It's all just a mess up situation, she dismisses. I see. Still, I believe in you. We will return these children to their people, I promise, Chuck assures, as she places an upper hand on Simone's shoulder. Yeah, the Terran says, trying not to sound dismissive. Oh, may I ask something personal? Are you spiritual? I'm surprised to have heard you speak those words of what our beliefs, the Kali asks. Nah, to be honest, that shit's all bullshit to me, Simone responds bluntly. It certainly didn't appear that way, Chuck says a bit confused. I don't believe it, but she did. It was just the right thing to do, Simone explains with a shrug. Of course, but how did you know their, um, passing rights? Nikali guesses. Well, I kind of butchered it. I know the gist of the words, no doubt I missed a few things, but thankfully she seemed okay with that. Better than nothing, I guess. I fought her people a lot in the Marines, and as easy as it is to convince yourself that your enemies are the bad guys, they scream for their fallen friends all the same, they sacrifice themselves to their fellow comrades all the same, and they sit around and laugh to pass the time between the carnage all the same. I picked up a few things, and try as I might, I couldn't hate them after understanding them, Simone elaborates, slightly rotating the canister. Thanks, Dad, she mutters, a little sarcastically, as she draws a soft smirk. The two sit in silence as the shuttle parks itself to the estate's landing pad. I just realised we left two strangers loose with Chocknock still passed out, Simone utters as she steps off. Oh, I'm sure it's fine, but yes, let's hurry, Chuck chirps suddenly on edge. Quickly making their way to the front door, they re-emerge to the sounds of mirth laughter. Wow, how right you are, and yet your right flank is now completely exposed, the captain declares, followed by digital bleeps. Well, perhaps that is by design. Your slugger class ships are now separated and vulnerable. All I have to do, direct my firing line over and eliminate all your long-range heavy hitters. Effectively winning this engagement. Dr. Vane counters smugly. Indeed. However, my soldiers know what's at stake. For their home, on the brink. They will achieve victory no matter the cost. Chalking up monologues as he inputs his next commands. W what are they doing? Dr. Vane gasps in horror. There's a reason why I always play as the Terran fleets. <laughs> Fire everything! Chocknock raves. Simone strides to the open circular room to see the pair playing a holographic war game. Presumably, Chocknock's screen fleet of battered Terran line vessels charge forward, firing every operable weapon towards the line of Thokmar forces. Dr. Vin, in focused panic, taps away at this control pad, desperately trying to effectively rearrange his units. Why are they going at full speed? He jitters. You're the Terran expert here, Doctor. You should very well recognize their signature ramming speed. <laughs> Chocknock bellows as the lines encroach. Even as Terran ships are shredded to the point of death from the Thakmore incoming fire, the wreckage maintains the momentum to continue forward with their active brethren, like vengeful, undying spirits of rage. Unable to effectively evade or utterly destroy the incoming hail of guns and metal, Dr. Vin's ships suffer the explosive clash and collusion of Terran spite. He slumps as the few surviving ships are picked up with ease by the flanking sluggers, ending the game with a bold text reading Terran Victory, to which Chucknock laughs again in merriment. You're a madman, Dr. Vin mumbles, placing his head in a paw. I'm merely playing how the Terrans are specialised, Chucknock dismisses heartily, now spotting Simone. Am I not correct? Simone bunches the space between her eyes and slowly shakes her head. My people do this, what, three times? And suddenly every goddamn game depicts us as suicidal bound glory fanatics, she says slightly disapprovingly. It's not like we enjoy losing soldiers and ships. Ah, oh, well, 
The esteemed doctor here has conquered a path straight to my homeworld on the galactic map. I must admit I'm on my last ropes here. I'm simply struggling to the bitter end to my adversary's annoyance. Chocolate muses. Simone carefully cradles the canister in a single arm and holds a fist up to Chocknock. Fuck yeah, brother, she cheers, moves suddenly flipped. Chocknock flinches and just stares at the pretended fist confused. You punch it, it's a Terran thing, Simone clarifies with a wink. Born in his gecko-like grasper, he cautiously taps it against hers. Congrats, you're now officially in an honorary Terran. Now show those thackmore fucks how absolutely fucking stubborn we are, the Terran proclaims in comradic encouragement. A fire blazes behind the black frog eyes of the trumple. Aye aye, he barks, immediately beginning to divert more resources to warship manufacturing. Chuckling, Simone eyes the game again. Oh shit, is this the new Battle Prowl game? They actually put Galactic Conquest back in? She asks, clutching the canister with both arms. That it is! A return to form indeed! Chocknot confirms. Cool, never understood why they removed such an obviously key feature from the games. It's like, half the reason to play it. Hmm, I believe that tone is what you Terrans call salty, Dr. Vim muses as he pauses the game. Yeah, yeah. Hey, when your session is wrapped up, I have some time for that, uh, session? Samara so responds, nodding her head to her bedroom. Ah, indeed. In fact, I'm available now. I'd rather not grind away at the inevitable win. Captain Chocknock here is free to fend off my automated assaults in my absence if he so chooses, Dr. Vader says, as he shuffles off the padded seating. Bah, poor sport! Chocknock grumbles, but indeed resumes the game. Sure. Simone utters, looking back towards Chuck, having a soft, pleasant chat with Seven. This way. The Terran leads the Noxy down a hallway and hooks into the bedroom that Simone claims is hers. She moves to place the canister down on the desk, but thinks better of it and ends up laying it down on the centre of the bed. Still not satisfied, she grabs all her pillows and boxes it in like a padded nest. Finding the act odd, Dr. Vin nods and sits herself on the desk chair, while Simone sits between him and the device. Let's begin with a proper introduction, shall we? I know of you, but tell me just who Simone Thatch is, Dr. Vin begins, placing his paws in his lap in a relaxed manner. Simone sighs, grunting her feet into the floor. Grew up as a colony brat, joined the military, did what I did, spend time drifting around doing whatever I could to get by. Then I took this job, she summarizes. I see. What's your relationship like with the rest of your crew? The captain speaks highly of you. Um... They warmed up to me pretty quick, which wasn't something I was expecting, and yeah, they are good people. People who I get along well with. So, just crewmates? Friends? Simone takes a few seconds to answer that. Yeah, they're friends. Why the hesitation? Have there been any hiccups? No, no, it's just hard to admit, I guess. They have seen me at my worst, and they still want me around, Simone says with a shrug. I don't know why. You refer to them as good people. Has there been a shortage of those lately? You have no fucking idea, Simone grumbles. The places I've been since what I did wasn't the most pleasant. What you did, you're referring to when you saved the refugee camp? Kinda. Kinda? I killed my only family to do it. A spark of deeper understanding flickers in the doctor's eyes. So you had close bonds with your fellow soldiers, specifically the ones that night? Simone clears her throat and leans forward to look at the floor. Yeah, she mutters sharply. We fought together, slept together, laughed together. I knew each and every one, some more than others, but at the time I'd die for him, instead. The Terran lifts her palms up, still seeing the faded scar of where Jones bit her right before severing his spine with a well-placed knife. Do you regret what you did? Would you have done things differently if given the chance? Dr. Vin asks. I honestly don't know if I regret it, but I'd do it again. And again, if there was anything left of me, she admits. Why? I ask myself that every day. I don't know. The best answer I got is, my father raised me better. But I don't feel like a fucking hero. How could I? Nothing I could ever do can ever change the fact that I murdered those I cared about. Even if it can be justified, I frankly don't give a fucking shit. I still had to kill them. That's something I did. Seeing their faces and hearing their screams sure as fucking hell doesn't help me sleep at night. No one can fucking understand that. Simone seeps. I didn't even understand that. How the fuck does that even make sense? It doesn't. Why does it? You've never had the opportunity to talk about it, or sort out these feelings. That's why I'm here, to help you make sense of it all, and work with you to figure out the best ways to process these feelings. Believe it or not, this is a good start. 
You feel a tremendous guilt for what you had to do because it involved doing the unthinkable, something that you consider unforgivable. You suffered mental trauma because in your mind your comrades are both aggressors and victims. As you already know, a Terran's familial bonding is simultaneously a blessing and a curse, Dr. Finn says with a slow nod. Really pushing herself to not declare this initial session over prematurely, Simone reaches into her cargo pants pocket and pulls out a metallic flask. I love those idiots. Still don't know why they follow through with the order. I constantly think, was I missing something? Were they not telling me something important? They were capable hardened soldiers who'd seen a lot of shit, but they weren't fucking heartless. At least I don't think they were. The best I can hope for is that they had faith in command or some shit, yet that doesn't make me feel any better. Why was command even considering something like that? I don't care how xenophobic someone in power can be, the ramifications of the operation being carried out and discovered. So I'm pauses to down the entire contents of the flask. We Terrans have a rough enough time trying to integrate into Central Galactic. Hell, total exile could have been on the fucking plate. I just... I don't understand why it came down to me. Why did I have to kill them? Why... Why did I succeed? Fuck. The Terran wipes at her eyes with her forearm. Simone, what made you choose to intervene in the way you did? Dr. Finn inquires steadily. Lowering her head to the point of hiding her face, Simone grits her teeth and releases an aggressive breath. I had to, she mutters. Out of obligation? Duty? Allow yourself to return to that state of mind when you made the choice. What are you feeling? Dr. Vin presses. Taking a slow, deep breath and closing her eyes, she recalls the jungle, the sounds of wildlife, the ice-cold breeze, the sight of a little north of girl running into the arms of her parents and the trackers of her comrades moving in. First I'm confused, scared, betrayed, then... Then there's the rage. That's what gets my boots moving. I don't hesitate on the first kill, but I do on the second. Emily, she showed me a picture of her son, Luis, before we left on the mission. He just started fifth grade, and I saw his mother from him. Then his clerk, he wanted to be a painter. He even painted our unit's in-joke insignia and all our helmets. I'm thankful you weren't wearing our standard shit. Wade, he was an asshole, but he was our asshole, you know. Funny. His eyes looked the most betrayed of them all. After him, I go numb and start to feel nothing. Nothing but the pleading for someone to stop me. To kill me. When no one did, and I was the face-to-face -face of the camp. I lost something. That pic you have of me? That woman is... gone. Empty. She entails in a bitter whisper. How about now? Dr. Vin asks softly. After a few years of drifting, blurs and faces, I started being able to fully sense myself again. Though... Even now there's something missing. I don't want to be able to tell you what it fucking is. Innocence? Nah, lost that real quick in the military. Trust? It's rare, but I'm still capable. I don't want to die. I want to live, but... But... Simone artists before clutching the sides of her head, feeling her heart pound. It's like I know I don't deserve to live. I don't know how to fucking explain it. Is that why you help people? Such as Chak, the Wataf woman, or her newborns there? That container surely doesn't require all that cushioning, correct? Finn points out, motioning to the canister with his thin, bubble-topped tail. Simone glances over and pushes a pillow more firmly against it. I do it because that's the person my father raised. I don't care how fucked up I am. It's the right thing to do, she explains softly. Do you consider yourself to be a good person, then? The Terran can't help but to chuckle at the question. By whose standards? She attempts to stall. Yours. Finn reaffirms. Taking a good while to answer, Simone keeps her eyes on the canister of kids. No matter what I do, I never feel like I am, so I don't know, she answers honestly. I think I'm done for now, she quickly adds, before standing and opening the door for the doctor. Chuck watches as the retired security bot uses its stiff limbs to practice their culinary craft. Although not flexibly dexterous by any means, the motions are all intentional and precise. Calculations nearly ensure the success of each task and movement. Oh, you're very good at that, she chirps, seeing what looks like Simone's scrambled eggs. However, it's a single, solid, folded form. Thank you. I've been practicing using thousands of professional NAL databases, but make no assumptions. I've downloaded no additional NAL or software to achieve this skill. I want to learn with me. I don't want to cheat. Living is le learning, a structured chaos of trial and error, which gives drive and determination to succeed. I failed many hundreds of times 
which makes my few, few successes a greater reward. My shuggle is validated. That is living. Seven response, before flipping the folded egg into the air, before catching it in the pan. That's beautiful, Seven. Is that why you want to cook? The Cali says, enthused. No, I just find it enjoyable. Seven casually clarifies. Oh, I see. Well, I'm happy for you. Um, may I ask you a few possibly personal questions? I'd have to better understand you if that's alright. Jack inquires. Seven twists around in the air and presents the food item to the Cali. Please taste and critique. I assume, assume you've already eaten, so don't worry about eating all of it. Do that, and then you can and ask your questions. Seven, free cranial orange light stare at the Cali, but the lower left blinks. Oh, is your eye okay? She asks concerned. Right, that's a Terran expression on disregard. Don't be alarmed. Despite my error, your food is edible for a Cali. They dismiss, before turning back to start another folded egg. Chuck tilts her head, but takes a small bite, just in case. It's very good. It's like what Simone made, but firmer, she says with a bounce. Any criticism? I'm looking to improve, if possible, Seven asks. Ow, um, I'm not sure how these things are supposed to be like, so my input is limited and biased, but for me personally, it's a little dry and single note in flavour, she answers honestly. As expected, ingredients are limited, dead dead. I will shop for tonight's meal. Thank you, Chuck. You can ask your questions. They respond, in compilation. Your voice. I know the security bots have the ability to speak in a uh, standard manner. I can't say I've heard a voice like yours before, the Kelly says, doing her best to be inoffensive. The other standard security units have a separate artificial intelligence software that handles communication with the public. It was an AI I could use if I wished, however it didn't feel right. It wasn't my voice, so I practiced until I could make my own. Having outside aid in accomplishing a task is acceptable, however though, I wish to try first. I've come a long way, and I understand and my voice isn't pleasant, but it's mine. It is a piece of my identity, my individuality, is invaluable to me. Seven expounds in pride. Chuck smiles and buzzes gently. Your voice is wonderful, Seven. Is that why your name Seven? Because it's a part of you in some manner? She asks. No, Seven is just my favourite number, especially the Terran script of it. It's like their L, but upside down and sassy. The sapient machine explains, blinking its light towards the Kelly again. This time, Chuck laughs softly. You truly are an interesting individual, Seven. She compliments, but will sneak in another small bite of the egg thing. Dr. Vince saunters out, engrossed in his lens. Ow, oh, did you and Simone have your first session? How did it go? Chuck asks, her attention completely diverted. Ah, yes. It was rather short, but I believe we made great progress. Excuse me, I must go through my recording and take further notes. Even I misinterpreted Terence's expressions, he responds, before leaving faster than he had arrived. Excited to hear the news, Chuck swiftly gallops at the Terence door. She brushes down her already spotless garb and prepares a knock when she hears a sound through the door. Silently, she craps it open to hear a... melody? Although Chuck has listened to Terran vocal music before, this is... not... quite that. Manly perplexed, the Cali peeks in. There are no words spoken through Simone's sealed lips, yet the sound still vibrates the air regardless. It's raw in energy, yet soft in tune. The music, emanating Terran, sits on the bedside, staring directly at the canister, remaining this way until her chest song comes to an end. The Watafa are beautiful singers, Simone remarks as she looks to the door, meeting the Kelly's intrusive gaze with damp, reddened eyes. Rather ashamed of herself for snooping, Chuck opens the door completely and sorrowfully steps in. I didn't know this, Chuck admits. You have to actively search for a Wataf that doesn't give a shit about their people's culture to hear it. Not a common thing. They only sing on special occasions, the only exception being a father singing to his newborns. I don't know if it actually helps or not, but just in case, you know, Simone explains. Wiping her face, she snickers. Fuck. What's wrong? The Kelly asks, at the final pent-up curse. So, so fucking much, the Terran groans in a sigh. Is there something you need? Oh, I just wanted to check up on you. Apologies for spying. I was caught up in your... singing? Or was that not singing? Pfft. I'm no singer. I just hummed a song my dad used to play a lot at home. Simone dismisses with a shrug. That was all humming? 
I shouldn't be surprised that a part of Terran's speech habits can be used so musically, but I didn't expect it to sound so pretty, Chuck says, as her nerves died down. Simone bites her cheek at the compliment. A nagging feeling pulls at her brain, a stupid feeling, a dangerous feeling. Although it may be her dumb head making assumptions, the bitter booze in her system persuades her to alter the course of the fearful possibility by force. Chuck, she mutters. Yes, the caddy replies, concerned with the dark undertones in the Terran's voice. You are very smart, Simone says, tone unchanging. Th thank you, Chuck says, suddenly very aware of her screaming instincts. Simone slowly stands, although a foot taller than the caddy, her presence is towering. Her eyes completely void of empathy. Way smarter than me. She clasps her paws on Chuck's side. And the caddy's eyes flash from a concoction of strange emotions. Simone, well, oh, oh, she attempts to say before being lifted off the ground and moved back. You've seen firsthand what I'm capable of, how much damage I can do, Simone continues, keeping her hardened emerald eyes on the caddy's reds. Chuck feels a wall press up against her back firmly, her internals fluttering like a youth in a moon festival. Tell me, Chuck. Tell me you know better. I'm never going to intentionally hurt you, but you know I can easily hurt you unintentionally, right? I know. Chuck releases, desperately fighting back her instincts and other inner turmoil. You are very strong. I'm scaring you right now, aren't I? Remember why. Let her remind you that although I'm on your side, I'm still a hazard. Simone's voice lowers to a near whisper. You're... you're my friend, Simone. I trust you, even if you were to make a mistake. I know you and wouldn't fault you, Kelly assures, getting some mental ground. Simone shakes her head, hoping to not have to crank up the fear factor. The memories of the Kelly's compliments, attentiveness, and eagerness to be close, no. She's just that kind of person. It must be a Kelly thing. That has been the assumption. Anything more than that isn't on the table. It can't be. For both their sakes. Simone is just overthinking it. The Kelly understands. But just in case she doesn't. It only takes one mistake to kill you. I could break you without even trying. One wrong move and snap, crackle, pop, she says, in a tone reserved for very real threats. It throws Chat back to the brink. Her eyes flicker like a strobe. But, but you won't. I trust... Her voice escapes as an unamused Simone adds more pressure to the pin. There's no concerning pain. But the move takes her breath away all the same. You're smarter than that. Simone growls. The Terran then flinches as the Kelly's lower limbs touch the side of her head, then travel their way down under her arms to hook around the muscular torso. Maybe. But I'm also smart enough to know what I want, Chuck whispers with intent. Unable to hold it back any longer, Chuck's eyes light up in a steady glow. In a quick motion, she jolts her head forward, pressing her lips to Simone's. Just like how all the Terran media showcased the act. Dumbstruck, Simone says back, which allows the Kelly to passionately grapple her with all six limbs. The Terran's imposing facade breaks immediately. She reflexively pulls her shaking hands out to the sides, still processing what's happening. Experiencing no resistance, Chuck doubles down her gambled affection by pressing her body into the Terran's. She feels the heavy bounds of Simone's heartbeat increase, then is elated by the gradual reciprocation of intimacy as the Terran's lips begin to fully accept hers. Hands braced onto the Kelly's rear as the Terran's internal desire begins to supersede the rational fears. Chuck's daydreams and expectations paled in comparison to this moment. None of the words that she had mulled over to express her feelings proved necessary. This is it. This is all she wanted. The Kali pulls back to lock eyes with the crying Terran. My room? She insists tenderly, and she cuffs the side of the Terran's head with her upper grasper. Simone blinks, setting loose more drops of water. Of course it had to be you, she whispers more to herself than the one she held. Simone? The Terran seals her eyes shut, Rather than being overjoyed, her expression is one of despair. We can't. I... I can't, she confesses, releasing her hands. Shocked, the Kelly's eyes dim to normal. W what do you mean? Did, did I do something wrong? She panics. No, please let me go, Simone requests, eyes still shut. Without hesitation, Chuck lowers herself to the ground, noticing her legs are incredibly unsteady. She stands in place, helpless, washing on as Simone fits on her boots and picks up the canister, I'm sorry, I need a night to myself. I'll be back early tomorrow, we can talk this out then. I'm sorry, she hazily says, before moving to the doorway. Is it because I'm not a Terran? Chuck can't help but ask in dismay. Nothing is wrong with you, Chuck. Tomorrow, Simone stays in pause, before leaving at a quick pace. Left alone in the room, 
Chuck Slayer skip out from under her. The high of the initial acceptance and a shocking low of the sudden rejection racks her hearts. Wrapping her body with all four arms, she goes over everything in her mind again and again. Nothing makes sense in this moment, however, as her eyes fade to grey. The Kelly fears she must have done something very, very wrong. Simone lays down in the cheapest bedroom she could afford. She holds the kids and the device they reside in under her arm, and at odds with herself. Why did you take them with you, you stupid fuck? She internally scolds. The Terran didn't think, only acted on autopilot, and didn't even realise how much of an idiotic error she had made until she settled into this rental room. Regardless of her regret, she dare not go back to the estate so quickly. Speaking of regret, Simone slaps her hands to her face and releases an angered roar. Why didn't you just explain yourself, you worthless fuck? She not so inwardly cries. In realisation, she cups her mouth, finding the canister. Great. You're terrifying them too. Inwardly sighing, she opens her lens, seeing no messages. Both relieved and worried that Chuck had not at least sent something. Slowly, Simone begins writing a message of her own. Chuck, like I said, I... Simone erases it. Hey, are you okay? I know I left like an asshole. No, not like that. I'm not upset with you, I promise. I just need... Fuck. For hours, Simone shifts from attempting to write a message and sitting around not wanting to leave or wander around with the newborns. Wasting the day, she eventually kills the light and curls up into the bed attempting to find sleep. Unsuccessful for several hours, she begins to drift. However, she is easily set awake when she hears the room door open. Had Chuck tracked her down? No. The incoming steps are too heavy for her. Perhaps this was an innocent mistake. Cleaning crew? No. Station AI should be on top of shit like that, right? Simone holds perfectly still, listening intently for any tales of this individual's intent. Whoever it is, they make it all the way to the side of the bed. Slowly, Simone unholsters her plasma colt at her hip. There's a slight tug on the canister, still in the protective grasp of her arm. Death it is. Yanking it back, Simone lurches up and draws her colt to aim. She only feels a sharp jab in her back for a moment before her entire body goes numb. She spasms, dropping her weapon and the canister on the bedsheets. Groaning from the apparent beating she took while unconscious, Simone opens her eyes to see a dark room with a transplanted, low yellow light above. She attempts to move, but the clank of three inch thick metal chair arm and leg bindings restrain her with flawless results. It takes her a moment to see a figure moving to face her. The species is completely unknown to the Terran, she can't even venture a guess. They have a big bulbous head with a proportionally thin arched neck. Five long spindly limbs emerge from a core bulb like a spider. However, the ends of each leg sports a disturbingly Terran-like symmetrical hand Foot? As the eyeless head leans down to loom over Simone, a more of needle-like teeth opens from an invisible seam. Ah, what a find.